delighted that you're here. We have visitors with us. We're glad that you've come and hope you can come back and be with us at other opportunities. The Christian life is referred to as a course. We see this in, second, in the 20th chapter of the book of Acts as Paul is talking to the elders of the church at Ephesus. He said, but none of these things move me, neither do I count my life dear to myself, so that I might finish my course. There's our word we're looking for. With joy in the ministry which I've received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. Paul talked about finishing his course. Well, perhaps you're thinking of this passage in 2 Timothy 4 and in verse 7, I fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I've kept the faith. In these two passages, the, past, the Bible is referring to the Christian life, living our life before God as a course, as a race, or perhaps you're thinking of a career. And so I finish my course, I finish my race. I want to suggest to you that if we finish the course, as Paul mentioned in those two texts, we must stay the course. You can't finish the course if you don't stay the course. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 said, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Here we see we're to be steadfast. There's other things in that verse, but I want you to focus on this word steadfast. Here's another passage mentions the same concept. Paul in Colossians 1 said, if indeed you continue in the faith grounded, and here's our word steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel. If we finish the course, we must stay the course. This word steadfast gives the idea of being settled, immovable, standing firm. If we finish the course, we must Stay the course. We must be steadfast. Staying, for, uh, staying the course is the goal of every Christian that wants to go to heaven. And so if you're wanting to go to heaven, which I assume that you do by your very presence this evening, that tells me that you're wanting to stay the course. Staying the course is the goal of every parent who points their child toward heaven. You want them to stay the course. You want to point them in that direction. You want them to stay in that direction. You want them to stay the course, but, but there are times that we get off course. In fact, in 1 John 1 and verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. There will be times that we do sin. And what I'm learning from that is that there will be some that will drift from the course. There will be others that take the wrong turn from the course. Some will make an absolute absolute U-turn from that course and go in the opposite direction. And no longer are they staying the course. So tonight, let's talk about some things that will help us stay the course. We understand from the text we've already introduced that we want to stay the course, that we might finish our course, finish our race. What are some things that contribute to that and help us to stay the course? If that's your goal, you're looking for things that help you stay the course. Here's the first. We're going to look at seven things tonight. Here's the first. One of the things that helps us stay the course is the training of parents. It is the training of parents. Proper training indeed is powerful. Numerous passages can make this point. But I want to look at the very opposite of what we're talking about. And let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 3 and in verse 13. 1 Samuel chapter 3 and in verse 13, and we read about Eli and his sons because Eli did not do proper restraining and proper teaching of his sons. And here's what the text says, For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows, because his sons made themselves vile and he did not restrain them. Here is the text that tells me that the lack of teaching and the lack of proper training, the pro lack of proper restraint, leads to a vile and a wicked life. And I'm learning from that that proper teaching and proper training indeed is powerful. It has a powerful impact. You are familiar You're with Proverbs 22, 6. We quote it quite often. That parental guidance will last. In fact, it works for many years to come. Train a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, that means it's much longer, much later than the training took place. When he is old, he'll not depart from it. 
And so what I'm learning from that is parental guidance lasts and it works for many years to come. It can contribute to and help that staying the course. We're reminded of passages we looked at last week as we talked about children departing from us and departing to the world. Children have a tendency to walk in the steps of their parents, to follow the example of their parents. Like mother, like daughter is the proverb of Ezekiel 16 and 44. We also looked at the example of the kings. Numerous kings were just like their fathers. They walked in the steps of their fathers. Those that were righteous followed in righteousness. Those that were wicked often followed after wickedness and abomination and idolatry. It's often true that teaching and training of the parents becomes more evident and more appreciated the older the child gets. We may see that in the, when the child is in their toddler years. We may see it a little bit later in their teen years. We may see it when they're in their college age, but it may be when they're young adults that we begin to see the impact of the teaching and the training of the parents. It's especially the time when the children begin to appreciate that and understand. They re realize the value of the training the parents have given them. So what is one of the things that will help stay the course? It may be that we're looking back to the things that we learn from our parents and the training and the teaching of our parents. They help us stay the course, but here's something else. What's going to help me stay the course that I might finish my course? The second thing we want to talk about is the teaching of the Word. The teaching and the instruction of the Word of God will help me stay the course. The Word of God is powerful. The Word of God is not a dead book. It's not an inactive book. It's not that I open the book and it's just a book written by some kind of man. But this is a powerful message. Let's look at Romans chapter 1 and in verse 16. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The word power is a word from which you well understand. We get our word dynamite. It has great power in it. It has the power of salvation. The word can lead us to being saved and lead us from the salvation from our sins and lead us to eternal life. Hebrews chapter 4 and in verse 12 says the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. What I'm trying to get you to see is the fact the word of God is powerful. It is an active message. We'll see more about that in other texts in a moment. The Word helps us keep on course. Let's go to the 119th Psalm. Psalm 119, that psalm that talks so much about uh, the Word of God itself, testimony to love and appreciation for the Word of God. The text says, Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I may not sin against thee. And so here is taking the Word, letting us feed upon the Word, that it leads us so that we're living a pure and a godly life. In Matthew chapter 4, you remember the example of Jesus when he was tempted by Satan that he recalled time and again it is written. Quoting from the book of Deuteronomy, it is written. And that's how he responded to the temptation. He stays the course by remembering the word. You see, when the word of God is taught, it's working. Again, it's not a dead message, it's working. Let's go to the book of Isaiah chapter 55. That scene of the great invitation talks about the power of the word. And I want you to notice verse 11. The word which goes forth from my mouth, it shall not return to me void, but shall accomplish that whereunto I sent it. In other words, when the word of God is disseminated, when the word of God goes forth, it is not empty, it's not useless, it's not void, but it accomplishes that which God intended for it to accomplish. So it's working and it's active. So you see the exposure that I have to gospel sermons, whatever that may be or wherever that may be, if it's true gospel preaching, it may be at a gospel meeting somewhere, maybe like a, me a message we're going to have this weekend with Michael Webb, it might be on a regular Sunday, it might be something you're listening to a podcast. The exposure that I have to gospel sermons is exposing me to a message that's going to help me stay the course. You see my exposure to Bible classes the more I learn from the text and the more I glean from the text, the more I'm keeping myself from sin. The exposure that I have to reading the text itself, in addition to those classes, in addition to those sermons, exposes me to the message that works in my life, works in me mightily, as we see that happening with the Thessalonians. What are some things that are going to help me stay the course that I might finish my course, that I not veer to the right or the left? Well, it's the training of our parents. It's the teaching of the Word. Thirdly, may I suggest remembering the consequences of our actions. Remembering the consequences. You see, knowing consequences serve as a deterrent to sin. 
Let's go to Genesis chapter 39, and as you're turning there, you well recognize this is the case of Joseph being tempted by Potiphar's wife. She seduced him. And she repeatedly was saying to him, come alive with me. And I want you to notice in verse 39, or verse 9 of chapter 39, that he said, no one is greater in this house than I, nor has he kept, no one uh, is greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you. Because you are his wife, how can I commit this great wickedness and sin against God? What he's saying is that there are consequences to sin. I recognize this is wickedness. I recognize there's problems with sin. And because of that, that served as a deterrent to sin. Let's look at James chapter 1 and in verse 15. When lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, it brings forth death. A separation from God. And so knowing the consequence that comes with sin serves as a deterrent. Consequences of getting off course would involve missing heaven itself. Those who are, for example, let's turn to Revelation chapter 21, if you will. And in verse 8, where the text says, The cowardly and the unbelieving, the abominable and the murderers and the sexually immoral, and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars. That's people who have veered off course shall have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. They miss heaven. Furthermore, a consequence of getting off course is we have eternal damnation. Romans 6 and in verse 23, the wages of sin is death. That's eternal separation from God. Remembering the consequence of sin. Let's go to the book of Hebrews chapter 10. You recall how that the book of Hebrews is encouraging Christians who are tempted to veer off course because of the pressure of persecution. In verse 26 beginning, he said, If we sin willfully after that we've received a knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. But a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversary. He said, Anyone who rejected Moses' law died without mercy at the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose shall he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot and counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace? Description of facing eternal damnation because of sin. Knowing that consequence serves as a deterrent. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 6. Another consequence to veering off course is that we may go further than we ever intended to go. We may go further than we ever intended to go. One of the warnings given in Hebrews chapter 6, which is somewhat of an interlude in this context, where he stops on in the argumentation that Christ is so much better to encourage them, don't give up, keep on pressing on and don't give up. Let's notice beginning at verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, having tasted of the heavenly gift and become partakers of the Holy Spirit, and tasted of the good word of God and the power of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again under repentance. In other words, they may go further than they wanted to go. They may veer off path. Be careful. If you veer off the path, you may go further away from the path, away from the course than you ever intended to go. Sin often does that. Carries us further than we ever intended for it to take us. And so knowing that consequence serves as a, as a deterrent to sin that kept, he keeps us on course. The consequence of staying on course is the home of eternal life with God in heaven. Notice Revelation 2 and verse 10. Be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee the crown of life. And so that is the consequence. So remembering the consequence of living right, the consequence of getting off path serves to keep us on course. We're talking about things that keep us on course. The training of our parents. The teaching of the word. Remembering the consequence. Number four, knowing that someone prays for you. Knowing that someone is praying for you. And maybe calling you by name. Before the God of heaven. Should serve as a powerful tool to keep you on course. Now let's talk about the fact. James chapter 5. That prayer indeed is powerful. We know this, but let's be reminded of this. Prayer is powerful. Look at verse 16. Confess your trespass to one another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. It's powerful. It's working. There is working in power in prayer. To illustrate that, let's notice verse 17. He illustrates it with Elijah. In other words, this is an application to New Testament Christians. You understand there's power in prayer. 
Well, well, James, show, show me that there's power in prayer. Okay, Elijah was a man of like nature as ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land by three, for three years and six months. You want to know about the power of prayer? Elijah prayed that it wouldn't rain, and it didn't rain. But he's not through. Look at verse 18. And he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. That illustrates the power of prayer. Prayer is powerful. Now, let me suggest to you that Jesus prayed for Peter and he told him about that. Let's go to Luke chapter 22. You're familiar with this scene. As Peter is going to face temptation, the Lord said to him, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you. Remember that there's a plural term used in verse 31 that Satan has asked for you, the disciples, all of you disciples. But Peter, I have prayed for you, the individual. I'm talking to you, Peter. I'm not talking to the I'm talking to you, Peter. I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. He said, Peter, I've prayed for you. I've been praying for you. I've been calling you by name. I'm praying for you. You see, Peter was close to Jesus. He was part of that inner circle, Peter, James, and John. Very close to Jesus. Turn to verse 60 now. Jesus had been warning him, you're going to betray me. I prayed for you that your faith wouldn't fail, but his faith failed. The bottom fell out of his faith. And I want you to notice verse 60 and 61 of this context. That when Peter finally said, man, I do not know what you're saying, he's denying the Lord. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, but Jesus had said what happened. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how that he said, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. He also had to remember Jesus had been praying for him. And I want to say, suggest to you that that must have had an impact on his return. That the Lord had warned me and he said he was praying for me that my faith wouldn't fail. But when he does fail, if I'd return to him, I could strengthen the brethren. Knowing someone prays for you. Don't forget people who love you are praying for you and calling you by name. It may be your parents are calling you by name. It may be your children that are calling you by name. It may be your mate that's calling you by name to the Lord and praying for you. Praying for your strength. Praying for your endurance. Praying that you'll go through the trial. That you'll come out on the other side. That you'll be strengthened. It may be someone in your family. It may be a loved one. Maybe other brethren, fellow Christians that are praying for you and they know your struggles and they're praying for you to go through that struggle and make it on the other side and come out stronger. One of the things that will help you stay the course is knowing somebody's praying for you and they care about you. We're talking about things that help us stay the course so that we don't get off course. Here's a fifth thing that we want to talk about and that is knowing that others trust you. Not only are they praying for you, but there are others who trust you. They have confidence in you. Let's go back to Genesis 39. Let's look at verse 8 this time. This is the case of Joseph, again, being tempted by Potiphar's wife. And I want you to note, notice that Joseph was moved to do the right thing and stay the course for a number of reasons. But one of the things was he was moved by the trust that his master had in him. Look at verse 8. When she seduced him, verse 7, she said, come lie with me. But he refused. And he said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what is with me in the house. And he's committed all that he has into my hand. And he later says, he's, he's trusted me with everything that he has. And said, I can have anything that he has except for you because you are his wife. What he's saying, my master trusts me. But that's helping me stay on course. I want to suggest to you that if we respect that trust, it's hard to betray that trust. Let's go to the book of Philemon. You recall the book of Philemon is this one chapter book that Paul writes to Philemon commending Onesimus, the runaway slave. And he said, therefore, I'm beginning at verse 8. I might be very bold to, com uh, to command you what is fitting. Yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you. Now look at verse 10. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I've begotten while in my chains. You see, he ran away a slave, and now he's obeyed the gospel. Paul's sending him back to Philemon, by the way. 
Verse 12, he said he was once, uh, verse 11, he was once unprofitable to you, but now it's profitable to me and to you. He's commending him. He said, I've got confidence in him, and you ought to have confidence in him now. I'm sending him back. See, he's obeyed the gospel. He was unprofitable. He ran away. But now he's profitable to me and to you. Look at verse 12. I am sending him back, therefore receive him. That is, my own heart Receive him like it was me. I've got confidence in him. You have confidence in him. But without your consent, I would do nothing. In other words, he said in verse 13, I'd like to keep him here, but without your consent, I wouldn't do that. I'm sending him back. I have trust in him. I want to tell you, when Onesimus is well aware of that, that's hard to betray that trust. Who is it that's trusting you? Well, there are people who look up to you as an example. There may be people looking to you that are not looking at me at all. They might not know who I am much, but they're looking to you as an example. And they have confidence in you. It may be the parents who have taught you. They have confidence. You're going to do the right thing. You're going to make the right decision. And when in the moment of temptation, you're going to come out on the right side. It might be your friends who know that you're a Christian. They know others are going to sidetrack and they know others are going to go the wrong direction, but they have confidence you're going to do the right thing because they've heard you talk about Christianity. They've heard you talk about your faith. They've heard you talk about your, your Bible. They've heard you talk about going to church. They've got confidence in you. It may be relatives that care about your soul that has confidence. You're going to come out on the right side. You're going to do the right thing. It might be fellow Christians. Someone has confidence in you. They trust you. But here's something else. We're talking about things that help us stay on the right course. Not only do others trust you, but others have confidence in you. In what sense? Others have confidence in you that you're going to do what's right. Not only are they going to trust you to do what's moral, they're going to trust you to stay on the right course. Jesus had confidence in Peter. Let's go back to Luke 22. We talked about his prayer and the power of that prayer. But I want to make another point from Luke chapter 22. And notice in Luke chapter 22 in verse 31, what he had confidence in Peter was that he said, I have prayed for you, look at verse 32, that your faith not fail. He didn't say, I don't think your faith will fail. I, I think your faith will fail. In fact, he says your faith will fail. I've prayed for you that it wouldn't, but when you return, your faith is going to fail. There's going to be a moment where you're going to cave. But what I want you to see at verse 32 is this. When you return to me, I have confidence you're coming back. I have every confidence that when you buckle under the pressure, you're going to snap too, and you're going to come back and you'll come to yourself. I have every confidence in that. And when you do, you strengthen your brethren. Paul had confidence in the Hebrews. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 6. What I mean by confidence, not only did they have trust, as we just mentioned in the other point, but, but he had confidence. He warned about apostasy in Hebrews chapter 6. We already talked about that little interlude in chapter 6 uh, earlier. And he warns about the danger of apostasy. And notice what he said. We are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation. Though we speak in this manner. What he'd been talking about. Well, back up to verse 8. He talked about just like thorns and briars that are rejected, there would be people who'd be rejected and be burned. In other words, they face eternal consequence. There, there are going to be people who turn astray and they're going to go aside and they'll be destroyed. But he said, I have better confidence. I have more confidence in that, in you. Let's go to chapter 10, same book. Hebrews chapter 10, look at verse 32. All the way through verse 39. We won't read all of that, but he, he has confidence in the Hebrews based upon their history. If the understanding of the letter be correct, this is written to a church in Palestine, perhaps Jerusalem. This is a church that had endured persecution. And so he says, beginning in verse 32, recall the former days after that you were illuminated, you endured a struggle, a great struggle and suffering. You've gone through trial, you endured the trial, and the fact that you endured it before tells me you can endure it now. Now drop down with me to verse 36. He said, for you have need of endurance. After you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. You need to endure the trials and the tribulation. Can you do it? Well, let's see. He said, uh, in verse 39, we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but those who continue to believe to the saving of the soul. I have every confidence you're going to stay the course. I don't believe you're going to give up. I don't believe you're going to quit. Now, when we talk about confidence, there are people that think you're going to stay the course. They would be surprised if you turned off course. 
There are people who have that confidence in you. There are people who have confidence that you're not going to yield to temptation. That if you're like Joseph, when someone says, maybe not, it may not be immorality, but in essence they're saying, come lie with me or steal with me or do whatever with me, that you're going to say, no, I'm not going to do it. There are people who have confidence you're going to do the right thing. There are people who are looking at you having confidence that you're going to grow and you're going to be stronger and you'll be better tomorrow, next year and the next than you are today. We're talking about things that help us stay the course. And finally, number seven, let's talk about maintaining the fear of God. What's going to help me stay the course so that I don't veer? One of the things is maintaining the fear of God. Let's define fear. There are two aspects of fear. Fear is like the two sides of a coin. The coin has a heads and a tails. They are inseparable, but they are distinct. They're not the same thing. On the one side of the coin of fear, there involves the awe of God. Someone said, I'll tell you what fear means. It means the awe of God. You stand in awe of his majesty and his power and his might. And you're right about that. That's the one side of the coin of fear. So let's go to Jonah chapter 1. Multiple passages can make this point. But let's go to the book of Jonah chapter 1 and look at verse 9. Jonah, as he was identifying himself to the people on the boat, he said, I am a Hebrew and I fear God, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. What's he focusing on? He focuses on the fear of God, but he's using the term fear in the sense of looking at the one who is the creator of all the universe. I stand in fear of God, the one who created the universe, the sea and the dry land. He's focusing on the awe of God. That's who I am. I am a Hebrew. And I stand in awe of God who created the universe. There's another aspect. Let's flip that coin over and look at the other side of the coin of fear. And fear also involves being afraid of displeasing God. Let's go to Psalm 119. We've already been there earlier, but let's go to verse 120. My flesh trembles for fear of you. And I'm afraid of your judgment. See, the fear of God not only means I stand in awe of God, it also means I'm afraid of displeasing God. When I see God said all liars will have their part in lake that burns with fire, then I tremble at the idea of even telling a lie. I don't want to even get close to telling a lie. So what I'm suggesting to you, one of the things that will keep us on course is maintaining that fear. Now what does fear mean that I will do? If I have the fear of God in my heart, I'm going to do whatever God says do. Let's start from the Deuteronomy passage, then we'll go to the Genesis passage. It's on the screen. Let's go to Deuteronomy 6. There is no book, by the way, let me footnote. There is no book that says more about the fear of God than the book of Deuteronomy. You want to study the fear of God, study the book of Deuteronomy. It says more about fear than any other book. Deuteronomy 6 in verse 2, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you, you and your sons and your grandson, all the days of your life, that your days may be prolonged. Do you see the connection between fear and doing what God says? You see, Moses is preaching to the people in this 30-day period before the conquering the land that what you need is the fear of God. And what that means is that you'll do whatever God tells you to do. Now let's go to the Genesis passage, Genesis 22. This is where God told Abram to, to sacrifice his son Isaac. And remember, he attempted to slay him and drew back the knife. And as he draws back the knife to slay his son, God stopped him and says, Now I know you fear God. Fear of God means you'll do whatever God tells you. What, what seems the extreme and to the utmost. What seems most difficult. What seems unreasonable. I'm going to do whatever God says if I fear God. Abraham did. But I want to suggest to you that the fear of God means I'll be dedicated and devoted. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 10 and look at verse 12. Deuteronomy 10 and verse 12. What does the Lord God require of you but to fear the Lord your God? There's our term fear. To walk in all of his ways and to love him and to serve him with all your heart and all your soul. Not just walking some of his ways, but all of his ways. Not just loving with part of your heart, but your whole heart. You put everything you have into the service of God. You're dedicated and devoted to God. That's what fear means. That's not all. May I suggest to you that the fear of God means that we're going to hate sin. Let's go to the book of Proverbs, the third division, and look at verse 7. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. There is a connection between fear and departing from evil. There's someone that says, I fear God, but they're continuing on in evil. They don't truly fear God. They're not afraid of displeasing him. 
perhaps don't even stand in awe of him. Let's go to the 16th division of the same book, Proverbs 16 and in verse 6. In mercy and truth, atonement is provided for iniquity, and by the fear of the Lord, one departs from evil. So I learned from that, the fear of God means you not only hate sin, but you depart from sin, maintaining the fear of God. So what have we seen in our study tonight? Well, uh, Christian life is compared to running a course, running a race. If we're going to finish the course, we've got to stay on course. We veer off. We don't finish the course. What are some things that contribute to and help me stay that course so that I don't get off course? Well, training of parents has a big impact upon that. Teaching of the Word makes all the difference in the world. Remembering there are consequences to getting off the course. Remembering somebody's praying for you. Knowing others trust you. Others have confidence you're going to stay the course. And maintaining the fear of God will help you stay the course. May God help us to stay on that course and keep our race that we might be able to say like Paul, I have finished the course, I've kept the faith. I've made it to the end. There may be one or more present this evening who's not a Christian, who's not a child of God. Would you come believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Would you repent of your sins, acknowledge your faith, and be buried in the waters of baptism for the remission of sins? If you're subject in any way, would you come while together we stand and sing?